Okay, Be'ezat Hashem, Na'ase V'Natzliach. I want to welcome you to the Lighthouse Project as we begin a new series and uh, in the Did You Know series. And you know, if you've uh, come to the class in the past few years, every, every so often we get a couple of weeks where we can just do something that is not connected to the holidays, that is not connected to... Uh, uh, to whatever is going on, we almost have like a three or four, well, you know, it's the summer vacation. So we can do some different topics, off topics, still connected to, to Torah, still connected to the religion, but this particular series has been very, very popular for its subject matter. That's what's called Did You Know? It's typically things that you don't know. This particular class is going to be about water, a deeper understanding of water. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to get everything in in about two to three lessons. Like I said, I've been working on this for about three to four months. There's so much interesting stuff about uh, this element that we take for granted, this basic necessity of life. Uh, and I think it'll be very, very interesting uh, walking away from this class knowing what you, I promise you, you won't interact with water the same way again. I promise you that. I'm already not interacting with water the same way. Uh, the first class is going to be just an introduction. We're probably going to spend most of the time in Genesis. But the next two are going to be very, very, very interesting. A lot of halachot, a lot of science, a lot of interesting facts of, uh, of how water interacts in this world and how we interact with it. So, without further ado, I'd like to get started with... Uh, water, a deeper understanding. But before we get started, I'd like to give an honorable mention uh, to our class sponsors, uh, Guy Mordechai, doing this to the Ilu Nishmat of Ronen Ben Fani, and also doing this for the Fuah Shema of Hananya Ben Simo. Uh, also, we want to give a Fuah Shema for David Ben Zohara, Yaniv Ben Rina, Yeshayahu Yosef Ben Sari, Menachem Mendel Ben Sarah Batya, and also for the Ilu Nishmat of Devorah Bat Fega, Bat Shmuel. Um, let's get started. So, water. We take it for granted. We don't even think about it. I mean, we all enjoy a nice cold glass of water, right? Very refreshing, always feels so good. Yet, this basic element uh, is almost one of the biggest uh, players in human life uh, and on this planet. Before we can get started to even understand how we use it on a daily basis, I thought we should go to the beginning. Go all the way to Bereshit, all the way to Genesis, when we're first introduced to water. And let's see if we can start the journey from the beginning and see where it takes us. So, if we get started in Bereshit, it says, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. First pasuk, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? I'm going to skip around to, uh, to the to Pesukim that are relevant to this learning. Hashem decided that it's time to create light or to bring light in this world. So He created He saw that the light was good. He separated between light and darkness. And the separation of light and dark. That was the first day. Okay. The pasuk, the the the, the continues. Vayom Elokim Yer Akia Betoch Hamayim. Vayim Avdil Ben Mayim LeMayim. Whoop! There it is. There's our first introduction to water. It says that God says, "Let there be a Rakia Betoch Hamayim, like a sky between the um, uh, a separation between the waters. That should be separating between water and water." Hashem created the heavens or the sky. And he separated between the waters. So basically we have waters here 
And apparently there's water there. NASA is still in search of water. They found a few droplets on Mars. They found some meteors and comets that are completely consisted of, uh, of water. But uh, a planet that can house uh, life like Earth, they're still in search of. And what's that defining factor that, that can hold life as a planet? Water. But when you see that there is water there, if they keep searching, maybe they'll find it. Let's continue. That's what, uh, there was day, it was night, and it was the second day. Let's stop. Did anyone see that Hashem created the water? He says that Hashem separated the water, right? The water was there, then He separated it, and then there was water up there and water down here. When did God create water? It never says that He created water. As a matter of fact, if we flip the page back and just go back to the, to the, to the second pasuk in, uh, in Bereshit, it says, That the world was in upside down turmoil and there was darkness in the world. And, and Hashem's uh, wind or Ruach Elokim, like you could say, like the, the presence of God was floating above the water. Oh, wow. Water was there even before the second day. Water was there already on the first day. So when did God create water? If it was already there. So, not to overcomplicate things right off the bat, the Ramban gives a beautiful explanation for it. That lets us continue the lesson. It says, when it says, Bereshit bara Elokim et ha-shamayim ve-et He says that's when he created it. Because what's Shamaim? Sham Maim. Over there, there is water. So when Hashem created the heavens and the earth, when He said, when He created the heavens, the Shamaim, Sham Maim, the water got created at the exact same time. But I thought what was interesting that when you go through Bereshit and you go through each creation, it says, He created the trees, He created the animals, He created the human beings, and it was good, it was bad, He created it. But we never saw the creation of water. So it makes you think. But Baruch Hashem that the Ramban was able to settle our minds with that, uh, uh, with that insight. So, we see that the water has been there since the beginning of time. Since before everything. You have to, uh, we have to get introduced to the water properly. This is not just a, some, a regular thing that we're dealing with. Now, being that on the second day of creation... There was a separation of the waters. Chazal tell us that now the waters have two titles. One is called Maim El Yonim, the upper waters. And the lower waters are called Maim Tachtonim. And we have a situation. You should know that on every single day, the words, I'm sorry, that when Hashem saw that, what a surprise, welcome. What did you, what did you call them at, at the top? The, t- the upper waters are called Maim El Yonim, the upper waters, and the lower waters are called Maim Tachtonim. In almost every single day of creation, you'll see the words Kitov. For it is good. It was good. God saw that it was good. He was happy with his handiwork. Except for one day. Monday. Hashem doesn't like Mondays. Just like us. <laughs> Who likes to go back to work, right? On Monday, doesn't say that. Why? Chazal tell us because Monday was the day when separation, when machloket was created. When the, uh, when the upper waters and the lower waters got separated, that w- there was a division that was created in the world. Also, nothing new was created on Monday. Nothing new was created on Monday. Remember, the water and the earth were already there. What was done is that they were separated. So there was no new creation to say it was good. Secondly, Chazal tells us in the Midrash that hell was created on that day. Gehenom was created on Monday. 
So what happens? The lower waters are down here with hell. The upper waters are up there with heaven. And they come to God. And they say, why? The lower waters come to Kadosh Baruch Hu and tell Him, why? Why are we so far away from you? We used to be right there with you. We used to be one. Now you sent us and we're right here, down here below. You put us next to hell. We're so far away from you. Please bring us back to you. Because every creature, not creature, every creation, its core, its default setting is that they want to be close to God. Even us humans. At the end of the day, we really just want to be close to God. The Yitzhah has got us thinking otherwise because he's got 5,779 years of going at it. He's doing a good job. He's just doing his job. But every single thing, the tree wants to be close to God. The fish want to be close to God. The water want to be, wants to be close to God. Every single creation wants to be close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So on Monday, the waters came to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and said, why did you separate us? By the way, uh, the reason why it doesn't say the, the, the words Kitov is because that's the day that Machloket was created. How do we see a hint to that? For those of you that pray in the morning, we have a Shir Shel Yom. What's the Shir Shel Yom? There's the song of the day, every single day. What's the song for Monday? Shir Mizmor Livne Korach. Korach is the master of Machloket. It hints us to us that the Machloket was born on Mondays. So back to the lower waters coming to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, pleading to be close to them. Hashem says, listen, this is the way it has to be. But I'm going to appease you. I'm going to make it better for you. I'm going to give you something that's going to calm you down. So the lower water says, what is it going to be? There's going to be a time when there's going to be a place in this world called Bet HaMikdash. And they heard of Bet HaMikdash. And he says, and that's going to be my dwelling. That's where I'm going to live. And in Bet HaMikdash, one of the highest things, the, be- the, 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 the most lofty things that you can do in this building, in my home, in my dwelling, is going to be called Nisuch HaMaim, which is what we do, uh, what used to be done in the time of Bet HaMikdash, when Bet HaMikdash was with us. They used to, on the time of uh, Sukkot, they would wash Bet HaMikdash. They would throw water on it. And there's also Nisuch HaMayim. They would go to the corners and they put wine and water at the same time. It was like such a lofty thing. And he says, at the time of Bet HaMikdash, I'm going, the, the, the best thing that could be done will be done with water. And by Maimah Tachtanim said, oh, okay. Okay, it started to calm down. He says, not only that, it's going to be a home where they're going to be, Ami says, going to bring Korbanot. What's Korbanot? Sacrifices. And every single one of my sacrifices is going to require to have salt. Where does salt come from? From the ocean. And by the way, they call that Brit Melach, the covenant of the salt. What's the covenant of the salt? You should know that since we don't have Bet HaMikdash with us nowadays, a man's a table is... Shulchan Adam Hua Mizbeach. That's his, uh, you could say his uh, Mizbeach, his altar. So in a Jewish home, you'll notice that they always have salt on the table. Every Jewish home must have salt on the table because there must be salt on the Mizbeach. As a matter of fact, if it's not on the table, then what happens is, is that typically when they eat, they say, bring me the salt, and the salt needs to be on the table. It's a Brit Melach. From where? From the time of Bereshit. So, so, so the, the lower waters, Maim HaTachtonim said, okay, Nisucha, Nisucha Maim, okay, and then it's going to be the salt on the Korbanon, and then later on it's going to be the salt on the tables. They were appeased. And he says, and don't worry, when this whole world is finally created, I'm going to be right there and live with you. I'm going to be here. The way that you feel in the heavens is the way God is going to be here in the lower world. You're not missing out on anything. And thus, the lower wor- uh, waters and the, and the upper waters got created. And now we have the water that we have here in this world. And the water that's up in the heavens that NASA is still looking for.
you should know that the lower waters have a nickname. They're called Maim Bochim, crying waters. Even though that they got appeased by Kadosh Baruch Hu, but you know they're still not close to him. They're still down here, and right now we don't have Bet Hamikdash, and right now not everybody puts his uh, uh, his salt on the table. The lower waters are sort of like forgotten in a way. So, they're called Maim Bochim, the crying waters. They're still weeping that they're not close to God. As a matter of fact, something very, very interesting. If you ever read Tehillim, the 137th chapter in Tehillim talks about the time after the destruction of the Jewish temple when the Levites were uh, thrown out of Bet HaMikdash and, uh, and the Midrash has it that they even cut off their thumbs and they hung up their violins because the Levites used to play the instruments and they used to sing and they went to the river of, of Babylon and they began to sit by the river and cry so the, the Pasuk the, the, uh, the Tzaylim goes like this Try to imagine this. On the rivers of Babylon, there we sat, there we cried, remembering Zion. On those, uh, on those nights inside the city, we hung up our violins. And you know, they, they actually said that they shouldn't have cut their thumbs. They didn't want to play music for the, uh, for the nations that have taken over, right? But when you cut off your thumb, what do you do? You give up all hope. You think Hashem can't save you? Don't you think you're going to need that thumb again when He brings you back to Bet HaMikdash to play again? That wasn't something good that they did over there, but just to show you how hurt the day was, they wouldn't allow themselves to play the tunes of Bet HaMikdash to, to, to Gentiles that were tormenting them at the time. Because that's where the, 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 the captives asked them, Sing for us! Sing for us! And with happiness, the song that you used to sing in Zion. How can we sing God's song on a foreign land? I forget Jerusalem, I forget my right hand. What's forget my right hand? Forget my, 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 uh, my trade, my work, the thing that I know how to do. Are you ever going to forget how to write? You can't. It's part of you. If you're a craftsman, if it's a blacksmith, are you going to forget how to use your hammer? No. He says, if I forget you, Jerusalem, I should forget what I do with my right hand. So this particular Perik of Tehillim is very interesting. Why? What would bring the Levites to come and sit, or, or the Jews in general, to come and sit over there by the, by the river of Babel and to cry? Because they said, you are Maim Tachtonim. You're the lower waters. You're the Maim Bochim. You're the crying waters, the weeping waters. And you know what it feels like to be far away from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Only you understand what I'm going through right now. I am away from God, just like you away from God. Let's cry together. Nobody could understand their pain of being kicked out of Bet HaMikdash like the crying waters. As a matter of fact, this whole story of the crying waters, we have here an element with feelings and just like it could be sad it could also be angry in last week's parasha we spoke about many different things one of the subjects that was uh, uh, in last week's parasha was the subject of the sota the wayward woman the woman that was suspected by her husband for cheating Either she cheated and she was brought over to the Kohen, or even she was maybe suspected of cheating 
and brought over to the Kohen. And what is the process? You know, she needs to be warned by two witnesses. Then she, you know, then she has to uh, be suspected again. And then they finally bring her over to the to the Kohen, and they bring her in front of the copper basin, where they take from over there holy waters, Maim Kedoshim. The Kohen writes God's name, Shema Mefurash. It's the secret name of God that no, nobody knows. Only a select people in the world know it. And he would write it. And they would take this name and put it into the water. And God's name would get erased in these waters. And we would say, wow, God's name, Shema Mefurash, super holy name, super holy piece of paper. We're going to put it into a piece of... First of all, we're not allowed to erase God's name. If you write Yudke Vavke, you're stuck. <laughs> if you write Yudke Vavke on a piece of paper, you better believe that you can't erase it, first of all. Second of all, you got to take that piece of paper and bury it now. Or get creative with writing different things in order for it to be something else. You can't erase God's name. Yet we can erase God's name. Shem HaMefurash? How could that be? Well, Chazal tells us Hashem is willing to forgo His honor and forgo His holy name for the sake of Shalom Bayit. What should we do for Shalom Bayit? If Hashem is willing to erase His name so two couples can stay together and be happy, what should the husband do with his wife? What should the wife do with, his, with her husband? So here we are, we have these waters. And I think something very interesting that we should mention is, is, is this copper basin. You know, it was made from the mirrors of the woman of Yetziat Mitzrayim. Bishchut nashim tzadkaniyot nigalu. Meaning the only reason why we came out of Egypt is because of the righteous woman. What does that mean? I thought it was Moshe. I thought it was the Ten Plagues. I thought it was because our, you know, our, 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 our slave duty was over. This is something new. That because of Nashim uh, Tzadkaniyot, Nigalum Mitzrayim. So how, how could that be? So I'll, I'll just go off on a little tangent over here for the ladies. Because this is very, very beautiful. Very, very interesting. It says that in, in Ma'am Loez, it talks about them in Egypt. And last week's parasha, Rashi says something very interesting. And I'll share that both with you. So Ma'am Loez says that if you want to take a, a, a rip out a, a page out of the Jewish slave's life in Egypt, he says that the guy would be a slave for how many X amount of hours? 8 hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, and he'd come home. What did the Jewish slave come home to? Well, his wife, before, before he would come home, would go to the Yeor. And she'd go with two, with two buckets. You know, just like you see the Chinese woman with the long pole and the two buckets. She would take that to the Yeor. And she would put it into the Yeor to bring out two buckets of water. But while she's bringing out two buckets of water, it would be filled with little sardines. And those are the sardines that she would use to cook dinner for her husband. And that's the water that she would prepare for him for a hot, uh, a hot bath. By the way, segula lepiria verivia dagim ktanim. People that won't have a hard time getting pregnant, the rabbi says they should eat small fish. We learn it from here. So we see over here, that she would prepare dinner, a warm hot bath. When he opens up the door, she'll be all made up, looking super pretty. And when he's relaxing and getting ready to just like take the load off from the day, and while he's smelling the dinner that's waiting on the table, she would sit in front of this copper mirror. That's not the mirror that we have today where there's a glass and a silver behind it and it reflects. And it, reflects. it was copper that was polished so... Uh, 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 so finely that eventually the copper gave a reflection. So it was a copper mirror. It's a copper that reflected. So she would sit there and while he's get, relaxing, she'd brush her hair. She'd brush her hair. And, she would, and he would look at her and it would set the ambiance. And before you know it, the slave of, in Egypt was now a king in his own home. And they were able to have children. And those women have, it says, 
you know, the, the, the more, the, the harder that they worked the, the Jewish slaves, the more children they, they had. For example, the, the, the Levi tribe, when they counted them last, month, uh, last week, how many people were there? 22,000 in the Levi tribe. Compared to all the other tribes, there were four or five times more in size. So they asked, why would the size of every other tribe be so much more than the, uh, than the Levim? He says, because the, there was a certain bracha to the ones that were afflicted with hard work, avodat parech, that each woman got pregnant with six tuplets every time. The Levim didn't have avodat parech, so they had one baby at a time, two baby at a time. So they were a much smaller tribe. But because they went to the extent of making their husband feel like a king at home and keeping the Jewish nation alive, Hashem says, give me that mirror. That's the mirror that I'm going to have as the basin, kiyor, and the choshet. And when they bring the isha sota, they bring in front of him and be like, aren't you embarrassed? Aren't you embarrassed of yourself? You're here right now suspected of being an, an adulteress? And not only that, you know, for 210 years that we were in Egypt, not one woman cheated. There was not one scenario or case like this. There was one, Shulamit. Shulamit, she was like they say that she, was, uh, she would stand outside, say hello to everybody, and she got tricked. She didn't really go with somebody. The, 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 the Egyptian cop told her husband to go away at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. He came in, he did what he did, but she got tricked. But for 210 years, track record, zero. So now you're in Bet HaMikdash, in front of the copper basin that is made from those righteous women from Egypt, suspected of cheating? Back to the water. Oh, the Rashi. Rashi says that they would do the exact same thing. Last week's parasha says that they would do the exact same thing under an apple tree. And I was saying to myself, you know what? The Jew from 3,330 years ago had some serious game. <laughs> they had some really interesting ways of, of keeping things interesting as a slave. We're like watching TV nowadays. What are we doing? But anyways... What? Slaves to other things. Slaves to other things. So here comes this lady, and she is now in front of the copper basin. We got the Mai Me'arim, this combination of water and God's name. The Kohen Gadol opens up her hair. She's all loose. From here we learn also the woman needs to cover her hair when she's married. And they give her the water. Now, let's go back to Bereshit in order to understand what's going on over here. The first sin. What was the first sin? You mean Adam and Eve? Adam and Chava. What was the sin? To eat from the forbidden tree. Yes. That's on a first grade level. <laughs> okay. On a higher level, which I feel I can share already with you guys because you guys have been coming to the classes for many, many years. Okay. The Zohar says, you know, and if you have questions on this, I'll take questions later on so I can open it up for you more, but I'll just say it for the class. The Zohar says that the snake was jealous of Adam and Chava. He coveted Chava. And he went and he was able to corner her. And when he cornered her, he started convincing her, saying certain things. And she fell for it. And the Zohar tells us that the snake, the snake is not the way you imagine it now, a reptile. It's not. Okay? It's a different form. It had legs, it had arms, it was able to speak. Yeah. That's another reptilian people. <laughs> That's a reptilian people. That's another reptilian. Exactly. Yeah. So it says that he was able to convince her and he went with Chava before Adam. And he put in her the Zuhama. And he brought into the world death and. Uh, what they call it? Yeah. 
He brought into the world death and something else. I'll read it in a second. I'll tell it to you. Destruction. Well, but that Hava was no good, and she became the. <laughs> yeah, that's for, yeah. So now we see that the first sin was adultery. Uh-huh. Now, try to follow. God's ultimate purpose was remember what He told the Maim Tachtonim that I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you in this world. Just like I'm in the heavens, I'm going to be in this world. That was the plan. However, on the sixth day of creation, Chava sinned. And it caused the Shekhinah, God's holy presence, to go from this world to the high... Uh, to the. Okay, there are seven heavens. Okay? Or seven skies. Or seven levels between here and where God resides. So when Hashem was here, when Chava sinned, she pushed him away. That sin pushed Hashem away to one sky above. And as things progressed, Hashem started to get farther and farther away from us. First time, Chet of Chava. Second time, when Cain killed Hevel. Third time, Dor Enosh, when they started to work Avodah Zarah. Fourth time, uh, Mabul, the flood, the generation of the flood. Fifth time, Tower of Babylon. Sixth time, I'm sorry, six was it? Six, yes, was when Avraham Avinu was, in, no, I'm sorry, Sdom Vamora. And then we have the sixth time was when Avraham was in Mitzrayim. So seven t- different times where Hashem's Shekhinah got further and further and further and further away from us, starting from Chava. Who started to work on bringing this back? Who started to bring the Shekhinah back? The first person to start to fix the Chet of Adam Rishon, the Tikkun of Adam Rishon was Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu brought it from seven to six. Yitzchak, six to five. Yaakov, fifth to fourth. Levi, fourth to third. Levi had Amram. I'm sorry, Kehat. Amram, Moshe. Seven levels that brought it down. Levi, Kehat, Moshe. Until Moshe was able to bring it back into this world where? Right now, in the desert, in the Mishkan. The Shekhinah was living with us. So what started from Chava and was a deterioration of the generation uh, of the generations for so long was able to come back again after all this work that all our forefathers did in in the tribe of Levi all the way to Moshe to the Mishkan and here we are after the Shekhinah is here and we see this wayward woman so the waters Maim Tachtonim say you want to distance me from God again? You are doing the original sin of what Chava did? You're here now trying to start this whole process again of, of pushing again Hashem far, farther away from us? And what happens? The waters become angry. And they become, they want to, they seek revenge. And, and Harav Yosef Gektila from his uh, Sefer Sha'are Ora, and by the way, this I'm reading from Imre Noam, from Rav Yoram Michal Abergel, beautiful Chidush uh, over here. He says, he says that in Masechet Sota, when Chazal say, you know, when it talks about uh, the Sota, it says, Ish Ish, says why does it say ish ish when he finds himself that what does it say when a, when a, a, a man finds his wife being uh, suspected of something it's one person why does it say ish ish what's this kefilashon this double language of saying man man when he finds his wife and he suspects her he says because she's cheating on two people on her husband and on god ish ve ish because hashem ish milchama so he brings over here or chaim kadosh he says that these waters 
What do they become? They want to seek revenge. We already got a sour deal of being down here with you guys, being close to Gehenom. And now we finally fixed it. We finally came here to Bet HaMikdash or to the Mishkan. Now you're here? And they say that the water that have the combination of the ink and the Maim Kedoshim or whatever the Kohen did, they start to rip up her insides. Because what happens? What happens when a woman is guilty? So the water begin to work, and it begins to work, and it says that, you know, she drops to her knees, her stomach starts to blow up, and she explodes. But if she's innocent, she merits to have a baby boy that year. Okay? Bezat Hashem, the devils be innocent. But we see that the Maim Tachtonim are involved in the Sota. They have a lot to do. So when you see the Sota, we think, oh, she's guilty. He's guilty. She's guilty. The, the Kohen is that. Who even thinks about the water? Who thinks about this main character of that story? And why they're even concerned with what's going on over there? Hamayim kedoshim, from that copper basin that's made from the, uh, from the uh, mirrors of the righteous woman of Egypt. It says... Say it again. Is that why we have all tsunamis? That might, you might, like I said, uh, you weren't here for it, but I said this, oh, yeah. th- this lesson about water, it's probably going to be part two and a part three to it. This what is it? just an introduction, but speaking about tsunamis, hurricanes, or even such uh, rain that we're having today, uh, you know, there's a, there's a pasuk in Tehillim. Let me see if I can pull it up. But too much is not a bad thing. Just wonder where they get Mate of water is. Maim? 90. 90. Okay. Man is also 90, by the way. Brethren, so mm. it says, there's a pasuk that says, It says, when you come to Bet Elohim, to the house of God, what's the house of God? This is the house of God. This shul is the house of God. Now I'm only saying this pasuk in Tehidim because of the rain that's out. It says, <laughs> it says, when you come to the house of God, nehalech biragish. It says, come with fervor, with feelings. Like, let your heart, don't just come in here like, oh yeah, I'm coming to pray. Where's my seat? So the guys are, you know, you know you're like uh, going through the motions. You're like already like in robotic mode. It says, come with biragish. With passion that you come and you listen and you connect, you pray and you connect and you t- you're talking to God. But I once heard a midrash from my friend Noam Avidar. He says, "What's beregesh? What do you mean come to God's house beregesh? Regesh, ruach, geshem, sheleg. If it's windy, if it's rainy, or if it's snowy, beregesh. Or you could say ruach, geshem, shemesh. Sometimes it's too hot also." For Florida, we did tweaked it out for us. <laughs> you would say refugio in Spanish. What's refugio? Refugio, a place to be away from all um, dangers. Like a, a refuge. A refuge. <laughs> nice. So, just because it's a very rainy night, I'll give it some uh, attention. And it's connected, you know what? Very good. And it's connected to Maim Elyonim and Maim Tachtonim, exactly to what we're learning. So we know that we need water. And part of the ecosystem of the world is that we need rain. So you should know that there's two types of rain. So there's rain where the water becomes, uh, it, it evaporates or condens- uh, the condens- what would you call it when the what? condensation or uh, eva- the, the water evaporates and it begins to accumulate in the skies because it's very hot down here and very cold over there. So the whole that's the whole process of how water comes up and becomes a cloud. And then it begins to rain. And this is the rain that uh, waters the grass, grows the, you know, washes the streets, uh, you know, uh, water that is goes necessary, in goes in the mikveh. It's like for the day-to-day. And those are Maim Tachtonim. That's the rain that we get from Maim Tachtonim. These are not new waters. These are older waters that are just getting recycled. It's being taken up from here and taken up to the sky so they can get delivered somewhere else and rain again. 
So the, that water is actually Maim Tachtonim. Do we ever see Maim Elyonim in this world again? Like, do we still see some of those upper waters, the ones that are in the heavens, do they make a visit over here? Or are they stuck over there? Or Maim Tachtonim belongs to this world, and Maim Elyonim belongs to that world, and that's it? So the rabbis tell us no. Science also tells us no. The rabbis tell us when we pray for rain, and we, for example, in the winter portion of Barechenu, when we say Barech Halenu, there's a part that we say, Veten Tal Umatar Livracha. Give us dew and rain as a, for, for a blessing. Al Kol Pene Adama. So the rabbi says, I'm sorry, Veten Talumatar. He says, This is Talumatar rain that is Livracha. What do you mean for blessing? He says that there are special rains that come with a blessing. Meaning there's regular rain, and then there's a rain that comes with a blessing. Rain that comes and allows crops to grow, and allows things to flourish, and things allow to, to have a bracha instilled in them. Where does that come from? That's the rain from Mayim Elyonim. There are still waters that come all the way from the high heavens that come over here. And those are called Talumatar Livracha. That they come for a blessing. Science tells us that there's a lot of water that is floating in space. There's a lot of water floating in space that a lot of the comets or the shooting stars that we see are sometimes big bodies of water that come into this world. And that's another way, another delivery system of Maim and Yonim that come to this world. And that's also Livracha. When we pray, when, when, we, um, when we pray for rain, there's rain that destroys tsunamis, hurricanes, this like, you know, when water is not exactly something that you want, floods. floods. And then there's water that when it comes, it's, ac- it's exactly what you need at the right time, and it does, has the right effect, and it doesn't kill the crops, it just, it's, a, it's a water of bracha. And that's what we want to ask for. When we pray, Talumata Livracha. But now we're asking for do, no? So now in the summer we ask, Betalele Ratzon Bracha Undava. We still have the Bracha. We still ask it that it should be of blessed do. The, the secret of water, you know, there's so much to speak about. This, this introduction to, to the beginning of water in Bereshit, this whole concept that you should know that there's Maim Al Yonim, Maim Tachtonim, it's a very, very important concept to understand. Because later on in our, in our next lesson, we're going to explore how to interact with these waters. We're going to find out about. My God, netilat yadaim, ma'im rishonim, ma'im emtsaim, ma'im achronim. What is all that? Drinking water, not drinking water. What kind of water? When to drink water? When not to drink water? When is water healthy? When is water dangerous? I'm talking about this cup of water that you're holding in your hand right now, and I can give you ten different scenarios where the exact cup of water does. 10 different things. When is it a blessing? When does it have health? In other words, right now you can pour a glass of water and we could turn into 10 different realities. Right here, right now. Any one of us. You'd be surprised the power of water. You'd be surprised on the connection of water to Torah. And the connection of water to a Jew. And the connection of, of water to the way we live our lives. Nowadays, nowadays, we take water for granted. If you tune into the next lesson, you will never interact with water the same way again. The next two lessons are going to be 
more halacha lemaase, with the meanings for them, from Shulchan Aruch, from the Arizal, from the Torah, from Midrash, things that are going to, you know, I don't know if you guys ever took the classes that we did, uh, uh, the right way to start the day, the right way to end the day, or we talk about, we spoke about the king of all foods, the king of all drinks, I, I mean, I have people over here that are telling me right now, you know, after that class, they've never, sh- they, they can't shower the same way again, they can't go to the bathroom again the same way, it changes you, the next class, will change the way you interact with water. Just like the way we change the way we interact with bread, the way we interact with wine, the way we interact with ourselves. The next class is just going to make you understand that this glass of water and water itself has a, a tremendous amount of power that you can activate. And this is not some clinical studies that I'm going to bring you from like H2O with the uh, alkalines or anything like that. The rabbis have taught us how to utilize water the right way in our lives. I don't want to keep you too long. I just wanted to give a nice introduction. I really appreciate you guys coming here in the, in the rain and learning just a little bit more about Maim El Yonim, Maim Tachtonim, and the beginning stages of, uh, of water in, uh, in our world. And Be'ezat Hashem, uh, next week if you're able to make it, great if you're not able to make it they're working on it they're working on it but Bezat Hashem you uh, also tune in maybe and watch it on Facebook as well okay